Mr. Secretary, as always, thank you for your kind words and your gracious uh, inter introduction and for taking the time to come back and to be a part of this event and for introducing, for introducing me. You have been a long statesman for not only this state and this country, and you are a native of the Delta, and we appreciate your service and the council for me over these many years. Thank you so very much. To the Delta partners, our private sector supporters who have been so generous to invest in this conference and to be a part of the future of the region, I want to also say thank you. To Nikolai and Skip Rutherford and everyone at the Pres President Clinton School of Public Service, thank you for letting us join you in what we're doing today. Thank you for your partnership for today's activities. You know, I must also say thank you to Governor Mike Beebe for he and Ginger Beebe hosting us these couple of days that we're here and being such a strong example of public service for so many to follow. Missouri's Governor Jay Nixon, the DRA state co-chair, I am also very grateful for his guidance and for his service and support of what we're trying to do at the Delta Regional Authority, but particularly his designee, Chairman Bill Ransdell, for his leadership and hard work and making the DRA a priority. Along those same lines, I want to also say a special thank you to the DRA's alternate federal co-chair, Mike Marshall. Chairman Marshall, we're, there you are. Thank you for your service and your commitment to the Delta Regional Authority. I appreciate it a great deal. To the other members of the Delta Regional Authority Board, without whom I would not be able to have this job, to make the kind of investments in job-creating projects, to make the kind of projects work, it is truly a state-federal partnership. In fact, would the members of the Delta Regional Authority Board please stand and let me say thank you to you. Please be recognized by this crowd. Jim Byer, B. Fornis, Steve Jones, Senator Larry Woolard, Jonathan Ringo, Stacy Payton from Kentucky, Dole Robinson, and John Hagler, and Paul Fassbender from Tennessee. If I could please ask you all again to thank these individuals for what we do at the Delta Regional Authority for their willingness to put the DRA at the top of their list while serving their governors and their state. It is greatly appreciated. To the represented, <laughs> to the representatives of our local planning and development districts, you all know how much I appreciate the work that you do at the local level. You tackle the challenges of our communities. You are our frontline project managers, and I want to say thank you for your partnership. To the world-class speakers, elected officials, and distinguished guests that we've been able to pull together for this conference, I say thank you for your dedication to our cause and to our people. I also want to thank Melissa, my wife, and my aunt who's with me today, Colonel Linnell Jackson from Conway County. Thank you for coming and being with us today. Melissa, thank you for supporting them in this job. Sometimes I know it can be very difficult. And finally, let me say a special thank to the team who really helped put all of this together. The Delta Regional Authority staff, who we have worked real hard with the board to compile a wonderful team. And would the staff of the Delta Regional Authority please uh, stand and let me say thank you. I know they're off doing what they're supposed to be doing, but I want to thank them for their long hours of service. Thank you all again for coming. I feel truly blessed to be with all of you today. Welcome. As we share these first moments with old friends, making new contacts and getting down to business, I reflect on all the great work we have done together. The work to strengthen our people and our communities. But let us also recognize that the work we do today will mean great things for the future of our people and the Delta. That's why I'm excited to spend time with every one of you, to listen to you and to learn from you. I'm excited to do what we set out to do, and that is put the Delta first. All of us are committed to finding ways to make the Delta to continue to be competitive, innovative, aggressive, and forward thinking. This is truly an exciting time to be in the Delta. Let's take a moment and reflect of the true state of the Delta. 
to look down its main streets through its farmlands and along its riverbanks. The sights and the sounds at these places would seem for many of us normal. A store owner arriving to unlock her shop, workers arriving at the local paper mill to clock in, towboat tow boat crews coming back from a five-day shift. Those are the events, and it's just another day of our beautiful Delta, filled with the unnoticed events that we love. Simple events, basic events, everyday events. But we live far from everyday times. In fact, pick up any newspaper or watch a 24-hour cable network and you'll see we live in one of the most challenging times in our nation's history. The economy is slowly turning around, but it's clear that people across America are still struggling, struggling to find a job, struggling to pay their bills, and to keep their homes. But the most extraordinary part of the national economic struggle is that the people of the Delta have far too long faced these struggles every day. Economic struggles is the only world our people have known, and not just for a few years, but for generations. During these difficult times, the national poverty rate stands at more than 13%. But here in the Delta, poverty is more intense, more real in the 252 counties and parishes than perhaps anywhere in the country. In fact, more than 55% of our people live in the highest quintile of poverty in the nation. For many, it has been that way for generations. In fact, I think that we are a poor nation within a nation. It's not right. It's not right politically. It's not right economically. And sometimes it's not right morally. We can do better, and we will do better. We know poverty is not an isolated issue that impacts our families, but it is one that impacts our kids, the way they grow and learn. Today, our country is struggling to provide a quality education to its students. Nationally, more than 15% of individuals 25 or older lack a basic high school education. But in the Delta, that gap is even larger, with more than 20% of our young people lacking a high school diploma. Again, for many, it has been that way for generations. It's not right, and we can do better. It's no wonder, with the high school dropout rates like these, that people, and particularly Delta families from Monroe to Carbondale, just don't leave. Or they don't, in fact, earn almost 20,000 less than the average family. It's no wonder the per capita income in the Delta is 20% less than the national average. These are not just numbers on the screen. They mean that our kids, our grandkids, are more likely not to have the skills they need to get a good paying job and keep our region competitive. That too many neighbors will struggle to keep their homes. Too many friends will struggle to keep or to find a job. When we step back and look at the challenges facing the Delta, they seem endless. They seem generational with the problems of our grandparents and our great-grandparents challenging us today. Here's the honest truth. With all of these challenges, the Delta's small business owners, families, and students have every reason to give up and leave the Delta. In fact, other areas of the country are betting on just that, from Chicago to San Francisco, New York, and Los Angeles. They want our best and brightest. They want our entrepreneurs. They want our people, our idea, and our strong work ethic. They want our potential. But I'm optimistic. And yet in the face of this stark reality, early this morning, a young man by the name of Jason Sessions in Gould, Arkansas, he woke up and did what he has done for years, started his crop dusting plane and got right back to work. But you see, it hasn't been easy for Jason. In 2009, the owner of the crop dusting business where Jason had worked announced he was retiring. Jason's job would be eliminated. But Jason didn't leave Arkansas. He didn't give up on the Delta. Instead, he doubled down on the business and the Delta. 
with a little bit of savings and a lot of help from our outstanding Arkansas Small Business Technology Development Center, Jason is not only the pilot, but he also owns the plane and the business. And as Jason has said, my dream of owning a flying service was brought to life. For Jason, the solutions to this problem was never to get on a bus or head to a big city or even wait until part of our region falls into the river, as some have urged. That is not putting the Delta first, and our people are resilient. And like our people, resilient companies such as Viking Range in central Mississippi, Zapp's Potato Chips in southern Louisiana, the, the chocolate company in Memphis and in western Tennessee also see these challenges. And they have re recommitted themselves and their businesses to the Delta. Resiliency in the face of challenges is the Delta spirit. It is the way we are here every day. Every day, people across the Delta reaffirm their commitment to our land. But the fundamental pieces of their lives, family, faith, and to the future of the world that we call home, these are the values of the Delta and our people. They are our past, our roots, and our heritage. We see these values in explorers who, without adequate maps and adequate medicine, settled along the Mississippi River, and the farmers who, without adequate technology, work the Delta soil. Our great-grandparents understood that doing nothing in the face of a challenge meant certain death. For them, as for us today, doing nothing was never an option. That's why I feel so blessed to be here with you today. All of you are on the front lines of our region's recovery, turning our challenges into opportunities. And have no doubt, that's exactly what you do every day. That's what we're doing at the Delta Regional Authority. And when you help a small business owner update a business plan, or work to implement a community-based health plan, or stay late so a worker can gain new skills and experiences, you are doing the heavy lifting, shouldering our stronger, common future. And I want to thank you for that. Doing nothing has never been an option for you or our people. And I can tell you it is also not an option for President Obama. Through his White House Rural Council, the President has put a renewed focus on investing in rural America. He has directed federal stakeholders to find competitive advantages in rural America and use them to grow the economy. And for the first time in DRA history, the administration has asked us to be at the table. That's a new voice for our people and our region because the president recognizes that when rural America does well, or in this case, when the Delta does well, America does well. I want to thank him and all of our federal partners, particularly USDA Rural Development, our strongest and long-lasting partner. For those state directors that are with us, I appreciate your support and leadership. But let us also thank the people who are not here today. Let's take a moment to honor the small business owner, the workers, and the families, the community advocates who give us this moment together, who take on these challenges day in and day out. I want to thank them as well. My goal over these few days is to listen and to learn from all of you. I'm excited to find new ways to keep the Delta competitive, to keep the Delta innovative, to keep the Delta moving forward. Sharing this time with you is also why I feel blessed, quite frankly, to work for the Delta Regional Authority. I wake up every day and after kissing my wife, Melissa, and my girls, Mia and Ava, I focus on how I can run this agency more efficiently. I focus on how to make it more responsive, more accountable, and more effective so we can make the lives of Delta families a little better. You may or may not know this quote, but there is a preacher who talks about how God doesn't just show up, but God shows up and shows out. This is my goal at the Delta Regional Authority, to show up and to show out for our people and our land. Let's talk a minute.
Let's talk a minute about how the DRA, in conjunction with our governors and their designees, shows out and shows out for our people. The Delta Regional Authority has invested more than $94 million into 652 projects, including 65 new projects this year. To date, these direct investments have helped save or create an estimated 40,000 jobs in our region and leverage an additional $634 million from federal, state, and other local stakeholders. Our work has helped attract $2.3 billion in private resources. That's right, billion with a B. For every one tax, taxpayer dollar we spend, we attract 24 private dollars. That means more working capital for small businesses, better access to quality health care, particularly in our rural communities, and better roads and rails to make us more efficient and more competitive. In fact, according to USDA, each dollar invested by the Delta Regional Authority increased the annual personal income by $15. Simply put, that's a lot of showing out for our people. And thank you, DRA, and thank you for our local development districts for that hard work. This work is rooted in a deep understanding of our people, our communities, and our region, of what investments we have tried in the past, what of, of what has worked, and what has certainly failed. But when it comes to investments, some believe the stock market is the best investment over the long run. Others say gold and silver, but you know, I think that principle necessarily is not correct. I think the best investment DRA or we can make is in our people. In creating a dedicated source of education, healthy workers, that's exactly why one of the Delta Regional Authority's primary responsibility is to help develop a cutting edge workforce. When I meet with business and industry leaders across the region, one of the first questions out of their mouth is about the workforce not about how much money we're gonna put on the table or red tape we're gonna cut, that's important, but they ask about workers. Are they trained? Are they educated? Are they healthy? And when they ask these questions, I point directly to the public universities, community colleges, and technical training centers across the region. I point to the pipeline of skilled workers being created right now at Mid-South Community College through their ad tech program. I point to Mid-South because they understand that creating a pipeline of skilled workers is a two-way street, both with teachers passing on their knowledge and advanced machinery, while the school's leadership works to understand the needs of regional businesses. Earlier this year, in fact, along with SBA's Deputy Administrator and USDA's Assistant Undersecretary for Rural Development, we toured Mid-South Training Lab in West Memphis and students there are receiving excellent hands-on training in repairing some of the world's most sophisticated jet engines. And when these students graduate, they don't have to move to Denver or Chicago or Atlanta because they can go to work in a little bitty Delta-based company right across the river called FedEx. It just happens to be the world's largest cargo shipping company. That is a partnership for success. And because of that, young people are seeing more reasons to stay in the region, and businesses gain the workforce they need to grow. That is a win-win for the Delta. But we can't stop there. Even jet engine experts understand that a sick worker is going to be less productive. Growing a healthy Delta workforce must also remain a priority. To reach this goal, we have made a long-term investment in the health of the Delta people, and looking at the health challenges we face, a long-term investment is needed. Again, let's take a moment and look at the state of the Delta's health. As I said earlier, poverty is not an isolated issue. Let me tell you what poverty means in human terms. It means by the end of the year, the Delta sadly leads the nationwide trend of higher obesity rates. Year by year, as former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee has once been quoted saying, we are killing ourselves with a knife and fork. Medical studies have shown that higher obesity rates drive expensive health problems, such as heart disease, diabetes, and shorter life expectancy. In fact, compared with national rates, death in the Delta region from circulatory diseases are more than 21% higher than the nation. 
On average, men and women in the Delta live six years less than men and women across the country. That means the life expectancy of many Delta workers lags behind countries even like the Philippines. We run the risk of being the first generation of parents to outlive our children. That isn't simply a national health academic, it's an economic and a moral academic. Together, we can solve these issues. That is why to increase access to quality health care, we've expanded our Delta Doctors Initiative. This innovative approach allows foreign-born physicians who are trained in this country to work in medically underserved areas. Today, we have delivered more than 165 doctors to rural communities across the Delta, bringing the world's best and brightest doctors to people who need them the most. We are also working with community leaders to make sure to make sure they have the tools they need to provide first-rate care. We recently invested in a new digital mammography machine for Western Kentucky. This technology will eliminate a 100-mile round-trip commute for women looking to receive a screening. That will not only make it easier for women to access quality care, but to stay healthy and to be more productive. But even the healthiest, most skilled worker can't be productive if she can't get to work. The most talented innovator can't brainstorm if he can't share his ideas. That's why the Delta Regional Authority also works to invest in our public infrastructure and transportation systems. Our roads and rails don't just help connect our businesses and communities together today, they connect all of us to a stronger, stronger economic future tomorrow. Take our work with Lakeside Steel in Alabama. Together with state leaders and the mayor, Sheldon Day, and our board director, and local development district, the DRA invested in a new rail spur needed to develop a steel facility. Today we're proud to say that company projects a manufacturing startup date for early next year. The creation of over 300 good paying jobs, the infusion of over $60 million in that region of Alabama and the possible spin-off businesses. We aren't just focused on old forms of infrastructure. We are also making serious strides to boost access to technology, a key to the growing of tomorrow's economy. Today in the Delta footprint, nearly 20% of the counties and parishes lack high-speed internet. Seven of the eight Delta states have less access to high-speed internet than non-DRA counterparts. And I'm proud we've announced this week a new partnership with the Federal Communications Commission to help underserved Delta communities access broadband internet. The pilot, pro the pilot program called Connect to Compete will offer, will offer eligible families a 70% discount on the cost of their monthly broadband service. The Delta Regional Authority is now working to identify areas of need and making sure other stakeholders are at the table. Also this week, Business Insider Magazine named Jonesboro the number one micropolitan area to become the next Silicon Valley. That is great news for the Delta. I want to congratulate the team in Northwest Arkansas for all of their hard work. That is exactly the kind of sign we want hanging on the region's door. Congratulations, Northwest Arkansas. While we invest in the waves of the future, we cannot forget about the ways of the past, especially our ports and navigable waterways. Remember, our rivers connected people and families before roads, planes, and even the internet. Here in Arkansas, waterways have created 17,000 jobs and generated a total of economic impact over $811 million each year. The Arkansas River alone carries about 13 tons of cargo a year. That's enough cargo to remove 1,400 trucks off of the region's roads and highways every day, 365 days a year. That's an environmental and an economic opportunity for our region. To, maxi to maximize that opportunity, the Delta Regional Authority has invested $200,000 recently in the expansion of the Paducah-McCracken River Port. The additional resources will provide a new bridge crane, expanding the port's ability to handle, to handle larger loads. 
With the upcoming expansion of the Panama Canal and increased traffic on the Mississippi, our investment in river infrastructure from dredging river bottoms to securing levees and locks will bring ripples of investment to the entire Delta region. I call on everyone in this room to urge our state and federal partners to keep investments in our ports and navigable waterways a national priority. We cannot lose this opportunity. What is the outcome of all of these investments? We're growing the Delta's regional competitiveness, and we are putting the new competitiveness to bear right here in the Delta. That's exactly what we did with Electrolux, a global leader in household appliances. Electrolux, as many of you may know, was considering building a new facility. The only question was, would it be going to, would it be staying here in the United States or going to Mexico? Together with resources provided by then Tennessee Governor Bredesen and now Governor Haslam, city and county mayors, the regional chamber of commerce and the local development districts and the DRA, we put together and built a regional proposal. And in the end, the new Electrolux facility will be built in Memphis, not in Mexico. It will bring 1,200 good paying manufacturing jobs, manufacturing jobs to the region and estimated 2,000 additional jobs as support businesses. That is a win for Electrolux, that's a win for the Delta, and that's a win for the region. And how were we able to do this? Exactly because of the skilled pipeline of workers being trained in the region. And exactly because of the investments into infrastructure. It is truly an example of the Delta region working together to secure an economic foothold for the future. But here is the tough economic truth. Sometimes smart investments in skilled workers cannot overcome global challenges, and certainly global changes. Sadly, Electrolux is the exception to the rule these days, and the world is changing. The impact of the change is obvious. Think, for me for, think with me for a second. Every town in the Delta has a shell of an abandoned manufacturing plant. Every town has a mile after mile of short line rail that has been turned into a grassy mound. It is clear our region's strengths during the industrial expansion are not enough to help us compete in the 21st century global economy. We must recognize that the threat our manufacturing sector has is very real. The answer, though, is just as real. We can see it every time an unemployed worker with an idea and a bit of savings starts a small business. Today, I'm encouraging all of the leaders in this room to embrace new entrepreneurial strategies required by the new economy. I'm calling on all of us to see these challenges of a shrinking manufacturing sector as an opportunity, an opportunity for the Delta to reinvent itself, to overcome these global historical changes, and to be stronger than it has ever been. The importance of these mom and pop business owners cannot be overstated. We know that from 2001 to 2009, a time spanning what is now being called the Great Recession, the number of small-owned businesses in the Delta region increased over 26 percent. Two out of every five jobs in the Delta region are created by microenterprises. In such a difficult economy, how much more challenging would our economic situation be without those jobs that were created by those small businesses? Today, many of them are poised to grow, and that means new jobs right here, right now. Some of them are even pursuing innovative strategies that will lead to future growth. To help mom and pops turn the corner, the Delta Regional Authority has put a renewed focus on business development and entrepreneurship. While looking for innovative ways to support our entrepreneurs in the future, we understand capital is the lifeblood of every small business. But far too long, Delta entrepreneurs and small businesses have struggled to access that basic working capital they need to turn their ideas into a reality. Today, I'm excited about the partnership that we've established between the DRA, the Small Business Administration, Axion Delta, Axion Texas, and Southeast Missouri University with Dr. James Stapleton. Partnerships that are bringing new source of capital and support coming to the Delta's responsible small business owners. I'm excited about the partnership because it will provide targeted loans to existing small businesses and entrepreneurs right here in the Delta. 
for Axion, it's worth clapping for. For Axion and our regional partners, this isn't simply about dollars. It's about a long-term commitment to these businesses and to the workers. Axion Delta is on the ground. They're in Cape and West Helena and North Little Rock, providing assistance and training and support throughout the life cycle of these businesses that we're recruiting. We also have a partnership with Southeast Missouri State University to expand their Operation Jumpstart. This is a nationally recognized micro-enterprise development program. And as a result of this partnership, leaders from over 160 agencies throughout the Delta completed a certification training and will soon be using this program to train aspiring entrepreneurs in their own communities. We are just getting started though. Operation Jumpstart will work with underserved entrepreneurs to create over 200 new small businesses in the next year alone, an expansion of entrepreneur communities within our region. Like any successful economic development strategy, this is not a one-size-fits-all approach. What works here in Arkansas or Missouri may not fit the model in Louisiana or Illinois or elsewhere. That's why all ideas and partnerships are on the table. We will identify new ways to get new resources into the hands of our business owners so they can do what they do best, grow the economy and create good paying jobs. I'm proud of the investment the Delta Regional Authority has made in our people and our future. Unlike many government agencies, we are not held down by red tape. We even have the authority to increase projects to 100% of federal funding. And if you're a small town mayor or a rural chamber of commerce looking to invest in your community, we offer a powerful tool. In many cases, our flexibility, particularly in the funding category, is the difference between getting a project up and running or leaving it on the side of the road. But let's be clear. Government does not create jobs, and spending alone is not the solution to our challenges. None of us alone can solve these problems. That's why in everything I have said today, I have returned to a common idea, regionalism, of building regional partnerships, identifying regional advantages and creating climates of opportunity. Believe it is, I believe it is the most powerful blueprint for the Delta to compete today and be strong for the years to come. In fact, a recent conversation highlighted this point to me very well. My staff and I had just toured the new point outside of Union City, Tennessee. It's going to be an amazing project, one that I believe that will certainly be an economic engine. But after the tour, a local representative spoke to me and was talking about the importance of the project. She said that she had hoped that the new port would bring and attract a large manufacturing company to the community. And then she stopped and added something I thought was pretty critical to the conversation. She said that even if a company did not come to her community, she hoped that the investment would at least attract a company to the region. How honest. Of course, each of us want a company to relocate in our own community, to bring that investment and infrastructure and good paying jobs to our own. That just makes sense. But she also understood something essential to us moving forward. All of us will lose if we have a go it alone attitude, that we can win if we work together. Gone are the days when every town could build its own water treatment plant facility, for example. Instead, we need to be thinking about less expensive and other ways to partner, regional solutions to these regional challenges. Gone are the days when outside of college football, Arkansas could view Louisiana as its competitor or an opponent. Instead, we need to be maximizing regional partnerships to compete against China and India and even against Seattle and Boston and Chicago. The go it alone attitude will only mean the problems of our past will be the problems of our future. We cannot allow that to happen and we will not allow that to happen at the Delta Regional Authority with our projects. Regionalism allows us to overcome our common problems. Think about it, a major company such as Electrolux Investing in Memphis means more jobs in Western Tennessee, of course, but it also means a promising future for students at Mid-South and Eastern Arkansas, good paying jobs for underutilized workers in Northern Mississippi, and even potentially the boot heel of Missouri. 
We are here because we believe our communities can only be strong if the region is strong. Sure, we are in tough political climate, a tough economic climate, but regardless, when it comes to creating jobs and driving investment in the Delta, we are partners and we must continue to be partners. All of us have a clear responsibility during this conference to find new partnerships to make the region stronger than it has ever been. I'm excited to get to work because I can see clearly that our work today is going to make the Delta leaders of the next generation from renewable energies using wood chips and sweet sorghum. Yes, our work today will make the Delta the future of our nation's bio-based economy. I can see clearly that our work today will make ancient Delta rivers the new channels for shipping goods from windmill parts created at a new manufacturing cluster to the household goods created by Electrolux. Our work today will make the Delta's future of industry a great place to be. And I can see clearly our work today will make our region a leader in tourism, from the Mississippi Blues Trail to the ecotourism of eastern Arkansas. Our work today will make the Delta the future of our nation's self-celebration. All of us are here because, tough as it may be, a brighter future is the only road. Now is a time of all hands on deck. It is an all hands on deck moment for all of us. Now is the time to double down on the Delta. Now is the time for us to put the Delta first. We are together on this. And to meet our people's hard work in kind, to meet their commitment in kind, then let me say simply, the future of the Delta is strong. Today all of us showed up and now let's go and show out for the people of the region and for the people of the Delta. God bless the Delta. God bless you. Thank you for listening to me. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for those remarks. We do have time for some questions, and I've got a couple mics in the audience, and so I'll try to call on you so everyone can hear you. I'll start with... Uh, yeah, don't be shy. I'm pretty thick skinned. I'm sure there's somebody out there that'd like yeah, to... Yeah, I'll start with that. The, the naysayers that may be out there that say, we've heard this story before. Yeah. Uh, we've been trying to do this for a while. Why now? What's changed? Well, I thank you for that question. I think his question was, why do we continue to invest in the Delta? Well, I can tell you very clearly, and let me make sure everybody understands when I say this. What's going on in the Delta is real. And this is an exciting time to be in the Delta. Yes, we've had generations over generations of poverty. Yes, we've had challenges. Yes, we've seen racism at full frontal assault. But you know what? The projects that I'm seeing every day are projects that are going to lead to new economic opportunities in the future, that will lead to new prosperity for our people, will lead to new economic leadership for the 21st century global economy with a skilled workforce, abundance of natural resources, and the kind of attitude that is good for business in the region. To do business in the Delta is a good thing. And we didn't get in this situation overnight, and we're not going to get out of it overnight. I mentioned at the beginning part of my speech that we have been suffering from these challenges for generations. Yeah, you talk about the great migration, of course. Good common sense would tell you when things are bad, oftentimes you've got to get the heck out of there. Who wants to stay in those kind of conditions? But our people are resilient and we are making tremendous strides. And I believe that the work that the DRA is doing is helping do that even more. I hope that we're around for 40 or 45 years like ARC. ARC has proven when you invest in regional strategies, when you invest in a regional advocate and a unified voice for the region, good things happen. You give me that same kind of money in another 40 years and I'll show you an economy that will lead the nation and the world in the 21st century global economy. And I welcome that debate any day of the week with any of our national policymakers. Anyone else? Right back there. Thank you. Let me know where you're from when you get your mic. Thank you. 
My name is Harry Brown. I'm the mayor of Stevens, Arkansas, located in Southwest Arkansas. I heard you say uh, a few minutes in your speech, a few minutes ago in your speech, that the uh, DRA possibly had monies available for regional water associations or the development of regional water associations. We in our small town have an abundance of water, and and at times, most of the time, anyway. And, and there's other water associations, smaller water associations that's close to us that want to connect to us uh, so that, that we can provide them with water. And on the same, uh, by the same token, we have a small community outside of Stevens that's located about a mile from, less than a mile from where our water stopped that needs water. There's about 10 households that, that, that cannot get water. And I'm wondering if there's funds available through the DRA for that to, uh, to help uh, us connect to that, those smaller water associations and also, at the same time, provide water to those 10 families. Well, Mayor, the short answer to that is yes, but let me expand on that for just a couple of points. One is, is that thank you for being a part of this conference and thank you for coming and being a part of these activities today. In fact, I know where Stevens is, Mayor. I know exactly where you're located. In fact, I've got a young man on my staff now, Toby Stevens, who is from Stevens in that part of the state. I spent a lot of time in your neck of the woods. And in fact, where is Renee? Renee, Southwest Planning and Development District, that is your first point of contact for the Delta Regional Authority resources. We work hand in glove with the local development districts. They are our frontline project managers and they are tremendous partners. That's how you gain access. The second part of that, Mayor, is you need to find Steve Jones. Where's Steve Jones at? Steve Jones? He is the governor's designee in Arkansas. When I say this is a true state federal partnership, it takes both of, the, both of us to make these projects happen. Yes, there's money available and we can put you through the process and we'd love to talk to you about that project. You're welcome, Mayor. Thank you. Yes, sir. Bob, right here. Little Rock. Um, whether some whether students are going to leave the Delta region or stay and build the Delta region, the number one thing they need is education. And I know you've been very involved in promoting broadband communication systems and there and something came out of your office about the Google program recently. Yes, uh, so what can we do to use that, to actually use that broadband capability to bring high quality education to all the people in the Delta region? It's a great question, sir. What was your name again? Gordon, Gordon Apple. Gordon Apple. Mr. Apple, thank you for that question and thank you again for being a part of the conference. He made reference to one of the things that we're trying to do is to get access in to Google, to have a conversation and an audience with them, to encourage them and to advocate on behalf of the region for their initiative to increase broadband into our part of the world. They're using all, using pilot projects all over the country. And when I see these things happening, the first thing that pops up on my radar screen is that, look, we have got to get an audience with these leaders in the business community to say when you're thinking about communities to try these ideas come here come to the delta region because we can do that we can make sure that that happens this particular project google fiber 100 i believe it's called it is really a real opportunity for us to do some to do some connectivity the other part of it is, is again i i i would focus on what we're doing at ad tech you know that is a consortium even with community colleges in montana for this biodiesel training, and they're doing that by using broadband technology to help deliver some of those services. So connectivity with our community colleges and businesses to drive home that training, I think is an incredible way for us to jumpstart that and create other strategies and initiatives, of which we can also help be a funding partner. DRA has four congressionally mandated areas of funding. Basic public infrastructure, which oftentimes can mean sewer and and wastewater, but also has been expanded to include IT projects, bro broadband projects, transportation projects. Now, not the transportation projects some of us oftentimes think about, like I-69 or I-40. We can do things to really help connect real economic development projects, like rail spurs that I'd mentioned in, in my speech, even with the ports, can be considered transportation-related projects. The third category is workforce education and training. 
We have put a lot of resources on the table over the last 11 years to make sure we create programs that help train the workforce for today and tomorrow. And that fourth one, which is one that Chairman Marshall and I have really tried to concentrate on, and that's that business development and entrepreneurship. So that is something that we look for other opportunities to partner in, and it's something that we care a great deal about. Thank you for your question. Bob, behind you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Larry Williams. I'm the Executive Director of Delta Citizens Alliance. We're headquartered in Greenville, Mississippi. However, we're a membership-based organization. Uh, our focus is on regional community development, um, and we serve the 55 counties and the Delta regions of Mississippi, Louisiana, and Arkansas. First of all, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to applaud you for your courage and that of DRA to uh, bring forth this um, need for entrepreneurial, um, entrepreneurial development in the Delta region uh, as one of the priority areas of economic development in, in, in the region. Um, uh, specifically, uh, minority business development um, um, opportunities uh, here in the Delta region as well. And the point I'm trying to get to is, is uh, you alluded to it uh, just a little bit earlier here, and you were talking about in order to be more globally comp competitive here in the Delta region, uh, the Delta is going to have to speak with one voice, sort of uh, speak with one voice. Uh, we're going to have to learn how to act as a region uh, to be even more competitive uh, in, in the 21st century. Could you um, elaborate on that just a little bit more uh, and what strategies uh, DR, DRA is utilizing uh, to get the region to realize that regionalism and um, acting as a region is, uh, is, an advan uh, is advantageous for us as, uh, from an economic development perspective? Thank you. Larry, thank you, and thank you for being part of the conference today. Larry, I want to make sure I understood your question. The first part of it was the work we're doing to really help create a stronger pipeline for our women and minority-owned businesses in the region, number one. And number two, this concept of regionalism. Let me take the regionalism first. It is something that, from a principal standpoint, we feel very strongly in. You know, we can no longer try to take this approach of, I want all the resources in one community. In fact, the reality of it is, is that government's never going to give us enough resources. Your state government's never going to have enough resources. Your local government's never going to have enough resources to do all the things that you want to do, particularly when it comes to infrastructure investment. And so when we talk about regionalism, we also have to have that conversation that sometimes we don't want to. The conversation about, okay, how can we really join our public services? How can we expand the services that we're providing, not just in this community, but maybe you join together as a county. And I'm not talking about just water treatment, Mayor. I'm talking about fire and police, education. Talking about, uh, talking about having conversations about regionalism that may be a little uncomfortable for our rural communities because they've never thought about it like that. There is nothing that we can't address with the challenges that we face from educational attainment, our health disparities, economic development that we cannot tackle by putting together regional strategies. Now we can talk regionalism all we want to, and it is, it, particularly right now in economic development, it's a cool, sexy word in economic development. Regionalism, we all want a piece of it. But the reality of it is, is that when we start making investments, those are the kinds of investments that are going to get rewarded. Those are the kinds of investments that we are actually putting a focus on at DRA. In fact, you will not get a project eligible if it is a project that is going to benefit one community. That will not be a project that will be funded, not in today's DRA. And that's also the case for many other federal stakeholders in their programs. We recognize that we can no longer do the kind of spending that we've been spending in this country. We recognize that we have to tighten our belts. We recognize that at the DRA. In fact, when all this debate was going on, we were at the table saying, look, we understand we're going to have to take a cut. We understand we're going to have to take a hickey. We're willing to do that. We do more with less 
than many of our federal partners are able to because we are small, we're nimble, and we're not covered up by a lot of the red tape that they are. But the reality of it is, is that you still have to have resources to make good, sound economic development investments. And you've got to do that with a regional strategy. Here's something else that we've come into contact with when it comes to regionalism. States working together with other states. When you've got border communities like West Memphis and Memphis, those are great opportunities to break down traditional barriers and to have stronger economic development strategies that create jobs. These projects are real. Industry loves it when you can show examples of where you're reaching across the river into other states to capitalize on resources that may be there from workforce education to infrastructure investment to just regular incentives. That is good for business. And what is also good for business is that continuing to make sure that every part of the program that we have, when we started thinking about putting a renewed focus on entrepreneurship and small business, we were sitting around, I think Bill Ramsdor and I, and even Mike Marshall, one of the things that came up in that course of that conversation is that you can't just have a single strategy to say, hey, we're going to do all we can for small business and entrepreneurship without having that conversation about we also have to make sure that we have mechanisms in place to bolster and to create new access to information and resources for our minority-owned businesses. Our minority population in the Delta is strong. They are a viable contingent of what we have to offer in the Delta. Our diversity is one of the best things that we have from our culture, our history, and certainly from our workforce. And we also have to make sure that we provide those same opportunities for everyone to have access to those same resources, which is why we're putting a strategy together in conjunction with the overall small business strategies so individuals can make sure they have access to capital, access to technical assistance, and access to information to be successful. We want everybody to have a seat at the table when it comes to accessing capital and making sure that that pipeline actually grows, that technical assistance can get there. One of the reasons that we reached out so strongly with Axion Delta is that traditional financial institutions have a hard time providing resources right now to our small businesses. In fact, they won't even look at you if you don't have a 630 or better credit rating. But we all know sitting around this room that when we have tough economic times, you're gonna run into some difficulties. And the credit score is not the sole source or an indicator for if you're gonna be a good small business owner or an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs are risk takers by nature. And as a result, we need to reward that risk, not penalize it. <laughs>